Batman is arguably the most iconic superhero of all time. People can look at just his symbol, having never seen any of the movies or read any of the comics, and still know who he is. But despite that, there was actually a time where Batman wasn't very famous, and the idea of making a movie about him seemed ridiculous. But we very nearly got one in the early 80s, based off a script written by Tom Mankiewicz. So, what if it happened? By the late 1970s, when most people thought about Batman, they most likely thought about the TV show starring Adam West. The show was beloved by a lot of people, and hoped to bring Batman into the American household in a way that comic books just couldn't. However, this did have a bit of a ripple effect, because despite how the show portrayed Batman and company in a very comedic and cheesy way, the Batman of the comics was a lot darker than that. However, the average person had never even read a Batman comic a day in their lives, and assumed that the way Batman was in the show was just how he usually was in the comics. Now, a young and ambitious film producer named Michael Uslan would purchase the film rights to Batman in April of 1979. Now, by this point, the show had long since ended, though it did receive regular reruns, which only reinforced the idea that Batman was a comedy character. But Uslan wanted to change that mentality. He wanted to make a Batman movie that was true to the original character, created by Bill Finger and Bob Kane, a dark and brooding film that would erase all memory of Batman's comedic roots. Now, Uslan grew up as a huge fan of the Batman comics, and while loving the direction they took with the character in the TV show, he just didn't feel it represented the characters the way they were meant to be seen, so he would go into the Batman movie business alongside his producing partner, Benjamin Melnicker, who had served as a producer on Harvey Hartman's shoot. Now, the pair would then form their own small production company called Bat Film Productions. Michael Uslan would shop the project around to various different movie studios, all of which would turn him down, believe it or not. You see, as I said, Hollywood just couldn't see Batman past the Adam West show. Now, Uslan apparently tried in vain to get them to read the older Batman comics, but nobody was interested in them. And he actually told a rather depressing story about how he was turned down by Columbia because the movie Annie wasn't as big of a hit as they were expecting. And you might be wondering, well, what the hell does that have to do with Batman? Well, so did Uslan, who was more than a little bit stumped by this, and Columbia then explained that Annie and Batman both came from the quote-unquote funny pages, and thus Batman was equally a risk. So yes, they actually thought Batman came from the newspaper comics instead of DC. Wow. Now, feeling depressed, Uslan would actually write his own script called Return of the Batman, that he would claim was actually not too dissimilar in tone to Alan Moore's The Dark Knight Returns, which released a few years after he wrote this script. Now, in late 1979, the pair would negotiate a deal with Casablanca Record and Filmworks. Casablanca had dipped their toes into the superhero industry once before. They were merged with a movie studio called Filmworks Entertainment, and together they attempted to make a movie about a Marvel character named Dazzler in the late 1970s, but that movie ultimately fell through. Now, part of Uslan's deal with Casablanca entailed that Uslan and Melnicker would have to be demoted to being executive producers. They would be replaced as regular producers by Peter Gruber and John Peters, who would work together previously on an American werewolf in London. However, despite this, a major movie studio was still not behind the project. Now, Casablanca would attempt to pitch the film to Universal, but they were turned down. But despite this, they were able to raise $15 million on their own, and officially announced the impending production of a Batman movie at the Comic Art Convention in 1980. Now, this announcement would pique the interest of Warner Brothers, who wanted another superhero franchise to run alongside Superman. 
Uslan would attempt to get big names involved in the production, and would look towards the James Bond franchise, he would attempt to get Richard Maibaum, who had written scripts for eight of the first nine Bond movies to pen a script, and Guy Hamilton, who had directed four Bond movies to direct the movie. However, they would both end up declining the offer. The last name that Uslan would contact was Tom Mankiewicz, who had written the script for three Bond movies, as well as the first Superman movie. Mankiewicz actually would end up accepting, and wrote a script titled The Batman in June of 1983. Now, this version of the movie would have been partly based on Steve Englehart's Batman from Detective Comics. Uslan wanted the Batman to be like Superman the movie, and feature an unknown in the role of Batman. As for the rest of the cast, he hoped to feature David Niven as Alfred Pennyworth, and William Holden as Commissioner Gordon. However, they would both tragically pass away in the early 80s, which would necessitate a change. Now, Peter O'Toole, meanwhile, is envisioned for the role of the Penguin, with Jack Nicholson playing the role of the Joker. So now, in this version of the movie, Bruce Wayne actually would have been a genius even early in his life. He would have built a hologram machine when he was only 10 years old. However, his parents would then tragically be gunned down after leaving a movie theater by Joe Chill. We would soon learn that Chill was actually employed by the Joker. Joker then repays the favor by spiking his wine and killing him. We would then see young Bruce begin his training. We would see a long montage showing everything that he went through, and all the various things he would dedicate his life to learn in order to become Batman. We would then later see that the bat element of his persona was inspired by a colony of bats that lived beneath Wayne Manor in a cave. Then these bats would swarm Bruce, and that's when he decides to use the bat as the symbol of choice. We'd soon see the debut of the Batman on the streets of Gotham, taking out a bunch of lowly street criminals. Now, during one of his criminal takedowns, he'd be spotted by Commissioner Gordon, who instigates a manhunt for the Batman. However, Batman is able to evade their attempts at capture. Now, meanwhile, Bruce begins developing his billionaire playboy persona and invites Councilman Rupert Thorne and his much younger wife, Silver St. Cloud, to Wayne Manor for a party he's hosting in celebration of Commissioner Gordon's birthday. Thorne ultimately declines due to Thomas Wayne being a political rival of his 20 years ago, but Silver actually decides to go without her husband. However, the party ends up being a disaster. It's crashed by the Joker and his gang, who threaten to kill Silver in exchange for everyone's wallets and jewelry. Bruce wants to do something about this, but he decides it's just not worth risking Silver's life. Now, Bruce later on walks Silver back home, and they get to have a bit of a moment together, though nothing outright romantic yet. Now, Commissioner Gordon is very depressed at his inability to stop the Joker, and he starts to drink when Batman shows up at his house. Now, Batman's finally able to convince Gordon that he's trying to help him, and they agree to work together from here on out. This would lead into yet another montage, where we'd see Batman performing heroic deeds and being awarded the key to the city in gratitude. We'd also see Gordon install Batphone into his office in order to call Batman when there is an emergency. However, things aren't really going well for Bruce in his personal life. Silver wants to begin a relationship relationship with him, but he turns her down because unbeknownst to her, he doesn't want her to get hurt, you know, due to her association with Batman, which leads to them having a bit of an argument with each other. So now we later see Penguin and the Joker agree to form an alliance against Batman, and we soon learn that Joker and Rupert Thorne have actually been working together for the last 20 years, and it was Rupert that actually hired Joker to kill Thomas and Martha Wayne. The two of them then team up to ransack City Hall in an attempt to draw out Batman. Their plan works, and Batman arrives on site, and there he meets Silver for the first time as Batman, and she starts following him around as he searches for clues. As they make their way into an elevator, the Penguin then cuts all the cables and sends them crashing down, but but Batman's able to repel himself and Silver to safety. A chase scene would then ensue, where we'd see Penguin officially defeated. Now, during this chase, Silver begins to notice certain similarities between Batman and Bruce, and begins to suspect that they might be the same person. The Joker would then hijack a live game show and threatens to murder a civilian every time that the Batman comes out. So Alfred convinces Bruce that maybe he should go to the opera that night instead. Now Silver is there as well with her husband Thorn, but their night is ruined once again, this time by a Batman imposter that actually bears a striking resemblance to the real one. Now Gordon tries to evacuate the opera house before Joker kills somebody, but he's too late and the mayor ends up being killed. However, Bruce and Silver are able to reconcile and they begin a proper relationship with each other. Bruce takes her to the circus, where we meet Dick Grayson and the rest of the Flying Graysons. However, the night is ruined again, Jesus, by Joker and the Batman imposter, who incite chaos by releasing all the animals. The ruckus causes Dick's parents to lose focus, and they tragically fall to their deaths. Bruce would then adopt Dick as his ward, and the pair bond over their shared tragedies. 
Thorne soon becomes the brand new mayor of Gotham City with help from the Joker. They soon fire Gordon from his post, and then they use the Bat phone to lure Batman into a trap by using Silver as bait. Now, Alfred knows that this is probably a trap, but Batman decides to go anyway. He insists that the Joker needs to be stopped at all costs. However, as he leaves, Dick sees Bruce put on the Bat suit, and he learns that he's Batman. Our final bat would then take place at Gotham City Museum, where Silver learns definitively that Bruce is Batman. Dick Grayson would then show up during this battle to help out his Robin. However, the battle goes in a very tragic direction when Thorn fatally shoots Silver. An enraged Batman then brutally murders Thorn. Yeah, murders him. Joker would then be apprehended, Gordon is reinstated as commissioner, and Batman and Robin are now cemented as Gotham's protectors. A number of different directors would express interest in the project, including Ivan Reitman, the future director of Ghostbusters, who wanted to make this a big-budget version of the 60s TV show, and cast Bill Murray in the role of Batman, Eddie Murphy in the role of Robin, and David Bowie in the role of the Joker, though Murphy's casting really doesn't make any sense, considering that Robin is a child in Mankiewicz's script, but whatever, whatever. Michael J. Fox apparently was also considered for the role of Robin, and Wes Craven was another director in consideration for the movie. The movie would end up apparently being rewritten at least nine different times. However, in the end, Warner Brothers would hire Tim Burton, following his success with Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Burton decided to scrap all the pre-existing versions in favor of starting over from scratch, though some elements did remain from Mankiewicz's version, such as Jack Nicholson being the Joker, and Joker being involved with Bruce's parents' murder. So what do I think of Tom Mankiewicz's version of Batman? Hmm, okay, so I have mixed feelings on this one for sure. There are good things about it and some bad things about it. Uh, there are unfortunately quite a few bad things. Um, I don't like the fact that they skip over a lot of stuff. I don't like the fact that his entire origin is done in a montage. There are some superheroes, I admit, that are better off having their origins done in a montage, like the Watchmen. Like when they did Watchmen, the opening montage, people thought the opening montage was the best part of the movie. So it can work, but Batman's a character I don't think you should gloss over with when it comes to the origin story uh, and then they do it again later when he's finding his footing as Batman they kind of just do it in a montage instead of actually showing him grow into the role you know what I mean I, I just I'm not a fan of that I don't think that's a good idea at all I know it worked in other things like I know when Spider-Man debuted in Tobey Maguire's he you know did it in a montage I know that but I don't know I just feel like it wouldn't work as well for Batman because Batman's not a silly character Batman's a serious character and they were trying to be darker with this version so, you know, but that's also a weird thing because this movie can't seem to decide if it wants to be dark or if it wants to be goofy. Because for as many dark things as there are in this movie, like, there are goofy things. Like, I forgot to mention that Rupert Thorne's death would have been by a giant pencil sharpener. Like, I'm not kidding, because they, they would be battling at an art museum. Batman would actually slingshot a giant thumbtack at him. He would then back into a giant pencil sharpener and die, which is so gory, yeah, but it's, like, also so goofy. Goofy. So it, it just it reminds me of a problem I had with Batman 89, which is that it just it couldn't decide if it wanted to be dark or silly. And that's why I like Batman Returns a lot more is because it's just dark pretty much all the way through. It's not trying to be family friendly. It was trying to just be gritty. And I liked it more. And I think most people didn't like that about the first one. So, you know, I think that would have been an even bigger issue with this one. Uh, Batman and killing in the first place, I think, would be a bad idea. Uh, and speaking of deaths, I, like, I know that it's not the Joker killing Martha and Thomas Wayne in this version, and I didn't really have a problem with that in Batman 89, but I, it still kind of limits the world, in my opinion, to have the Joker involved, even if he's not the one pulling the trigger. So, I, I'm not really a big fan of that either. Then you have to throw in these plot points that don't really go anywhere or are rushed. Like, they put in Robin so late in the movie that there really isn't any point putting him in. Not to mention, in my opinion, Robin shouldn't debut in the first Batman movie. Like, you should do, like, two or three movies with just Batman and then bring in Robin. You know, just to really build up the isolation of Batman. Just to make you want him to have a partner. I just feel like giving him a partner in movie one is a bad idea. And I would re definitely recommend no director ever does that in the future. Because that's just, that's just, it's too fast, in my opinion. Um, then Silver St. Cloud. Um, she'd be interesting as the love interest. But I don't know how well I'd be able to support them as a couple, considering that she's a married woman. And I know that her 
marriage is bad. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just the kind of guy that, that lets that stuff get to me. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there that thinks that sounds a little bit iffy. So, But then there are the plot points that don't really go anywhere. Like, Commissioner Gordon hates Batman at first, but then he just doesn't all of a sudden in a way I personally don't find very convincing. And then, the, you know, there's a subplot involving the Batman imposter, who they make a point of saying in the script is, like, really similar looking to him. So you, it makes you wonder, is he supposed to be, like, a long-lost twin, or is he a clone? We They don't even talk about it. Like, it never gets addressed. Which makes me wonder if they're going to save it for the sequel, but that's just, that's too big to save for a sequel, in my opinion. So, yeah, there's, there's elements of this I like, but there's so much of it that I think would be off about it. I don't think that, I think that if they, if they cut out a good chunk of the characters, finalized what the tone of the movie was going to be like, and maybe changed around the main romance a little bit, and didn't skip over the important aspects of his origin story, this movie would be really promising. It'd probably be really ahead of its time, and maybe it could have done for Batman what Christopher Reeve did for Superman. That would be great, honestly. I'm sure it could happen. I mean, there's great talent involved in this project. But overall, I'm personally happy with the fact that we got the Tim Burton movies instead. But let me know in the comments down below what you think of Tom Mankiewicz's version of Batman. Would you have preferred this to the Tim Burton one? Let me know all about that in the comments down below. Also, give this video a thumbs up and share it with all of your friends on all your various social media platforms. And speaking of social media, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Rinsler underscore productions, and I'll see all of you in the next video.